Okay, well, welcome everyone to the May 20th uh, IMAG MSM uh, Viral Pandemics Modeling Working Group. I appreciate everybody coming. I think we're very excited to have uh, Russell Irving speaking today. As I need to remind you, the meeting is being live streamed on YouTube and is recorded and will be made available uh, for public viewing after the meeting. As always, uh, the co-leads of the working group are myself, James Glazier, Reinhard Lavenbacher. We are ably assisted by Jim Sluka and Bruce Shapiro, from whom you've heard many times. Uh, our emails are here. We are always available for questions, comments, criticisms, ideas. And so please don't hesitate to let us know if there's anything we can do to make this working group more useful. We have our usual Slack channel, Twitter channel. Uh, we have an IMAG LinkedIn page. Uh, we have a YouTube channel where the videos go. Uh, content suggestions, contributions, postings would be most welcome. Uh, please work on the IMAG MSM Wiki page. Uh, if you have any problem getting to the IMAG MSM Wiki that requires uh, password access uh, do let us know if you have any suggestions for better ways of communicating and for distributing our wonderful set of seminars archivally. We'd appreciate that. And now I'd like to open the floor for our uh, announcements. Does anybody have any short announcements that they would like to make uh, before we move on to our speaker? Jim, I'd just like to mention that uh, we've talked about the IMAG meeting coming up and the idea that those of you in this working group sort of have a right of first refusal if you wish to share tracks or do presentations uh, on your topic areas. And this is kind of the last right of first refusal announcement because about midweek we're going with a out to the entire world uh, call for people who would like to uh, present multi-scale modeling stuff with an emphasis on um, infectious disease prevention, but not necessarily limited to that. So I think, John, let me maybe to clarify, if anybody has suggestions for speakers, uh, I think John would be happy to receive those. So if you, you have his email address, uh, you don't have to write a page summary of why you think people should speak. But if you give the name of the speaker, the email address, and a, a two word and a description of what they do, I think John can probably use that to assemble, a, start assembling a roster of speakers. And I think and that would, would that be helpful to you? Yes, just a simple email to me if you personally are interested in, in doing some of the stuff, just send me an email and say you're interested and then I'll get up with you and talk to you and follow up. Any other announcements before we move on? No. Okay, um, we have new wiki pages. Um, there is a new wiki page for publications relevant uh, to any of the issues of the working group, uh, please uh, use that. It's an opportunity to highlight your work. And if there are other uh, links or topics that are of interest, as we know, there are plenty of newspaper articles that are relevant to this area. There are articles written in the popular press and the scientific press that could be relevant. Uh, so please, uh, help us populate this, these sites with appropriate material. I remember, remind you as always, that this is not a COVID working group. Uh, we have a much broader remit than that. Uh, so anything having to do with viral or other infection and immune response uh, is germane, doesn't have to be COVID. Please help us uh, uh, populate that. Uh, next week, we have Philip Ball, uh, the noted science writer speaking, uh, Miriam uh, Rafalovich um, from SUNY, talking about viral infections and thrombosis. Uh, and then 
looking forward. We have uh, a variety of speakers coming up. Uh, please help us with suggestions for speakers and uh, ideas for good parents, especially good pairings. If you have two people who you think would be great to hear back to back, uh, let us know. Uh, that would be very helpful. And uh, feel free to suggest yourselves as speakers as well. There's no reason that we can't have you uh, speak and update us on your work. Uh, please remember to mute yourself if you're not speaking uh, to help with the audio quality. Um, uh, Rusty has agreed that uh, he wants to have discussions and questions during the meeting. Since he has the full meeting floor, that's fine. And he's agreed generously to stay on for the extra half hour at the end. Uh, so we have a full, uh, well, not quite 90 minutes because I've chewed up 10 minutes of your time and I apologize for that. Uh, but we have 80 minutes uh, for a broad ranging discussion of ideas about digital twins. We have a unique opportunity to take advantage of that here. Uh, I won't need to give a five minute A talk about digital twins, what they are, how you build them, what they mean, and uh, I will turn it over to Rusty. Okay, can everybody uh, hear me? Yes. Well, okay, loud and clear. Roger, Roger. Okay, I'm going to share my screen. Um, I'm going to do something you should never do in a presentation, experiment with PowerPoint for a second. So I'm in slideshow, but what I'm gonna do is put myself in presenter view. But is everybody now seeing from my screen, just the slide that says digital twins of practitioners view? No, we're seeing your whole screen. So you see the next slide thing. All right, that's a loser, I'll get out of that. Experiment now over. Uh, I'll put it together here. In this. this is like my class every week. Okay, so now you get a bigger view. All right, so first of all, I'd like to thank John Rice for staying in touch with me um, and asking me to do this. It's a it's a thrill and an honor, and you know my view of it is uh, I'm I'm taking up your eighty minutes of your life. Um, I want you to get the, your money's worth. So that's why I want it interactive. You know what, if I say some things you don't understand, just ask, we'll try to clarify them. And if you wanna call BS, call BS. It's, uh, I have thick skin. <laughs> I, uh, I grew up in a tough world. I, uh, I don't, you know, not much is gonna damage me. So, you know, th those are my only ground rules. Uh, so, here, you know, the way I, uh, got connected to John is there was a biomedical engineering conference. What John, about two years ago, two and a half years ago, I would say uh, at the university of Maryland, I was one of the keynote speakers, much of what I present, I actually gave two sessions on digital twins, a overview, and then an actual tutorial on the nuts and bolts of actually showing people how to build them in the digital twin um, ecosystem we built for building digital twins. Um, it's stuck in John's mind. And as he got involved with your group, he, uh, he kind of remembered some things I had said and thought they might be relevant. And that's really what, what brought me to you today. So what I'm going to talk to you about, I think one of the big challenges is I'm mostly going to talk to you about building digital twins of things in the inorganic world versus my understanding of this group, right? It's a lot of biology uh, backgrounds, you know, medical backgrounds, I think, uh, you know, biomedical backgrounds, which is the organic world. But I can tell you throughout my 35 year uh, research career with GE, I just crossed back and forth between the two worlds, in fact, and including a world that's neither organic or inorganic, which is the financial world, which there is an absolute tremendous amount of modeling sophistication that goes on there that's also applicable. Um, 
not going to mention other than a couple of things there, but as I, I spiral around and keep coming back to some main points, this will make more and more sense. You know, kind of trying to get some pre-intelligence on the group and what, you know, you might or might not be up to. I just thought it was important that, you know, I step back from now I, I kind of have the advantage of two years since I really was an active practitioner in charge of, you know, the engineering development of GE's digital twin platform. Um, and again, you know, time and distance give you a better perspective. And I feel more convicted and strongly about these six points um, that are really, you know, to me, some of the most important things to keep in mind as you endeavor to build digital twins and do things that will wind up being um, meaningful. So, you know, I kind of get this learning objectives thing. I do have some background and some work I did a long time ago building uh, long before it became fashionable in COVID, but building electronic classrooms, um, electronic testing systems for sailors in the United States Navy. And uh, there's a whole military standard for doing it called 1379D, if they still use that. And they really work off this whole learning objectives uh, curriculum. So that's why I'm laying this out. Um, if I really look at all of the places I've asked to go and places to observe, in particular NASA a few years ago, what I find is there are a lot of people that are very, very good at building a model or a simulation of some asset, asset or entity. In a lot of those places, they build them because they can. And this is very true of so much work that I oversaw at GE for a very long time. And I, you know, I would say as much as anything I learned uh, across these inorganic, organic, and financial fields, that probably the most important discussion to have before you spend a lot of time and money building anything is defining the outcome you want from a model. So let me dig a little into that because this is, you know, going to come up over and over again. We once had some rear admirals from the Navy come to where I was to learn about digital twins. And when we were done, one of the rear admirals says, okay, I want you guys to build me a digital twin for one of my aircraft carriers. And I sat there and I just went, wow, we got a lot of work to do here because he gets the idea and he can see the value, but he doesn't know where to begin. And that's because there's no reason to build a digital twin of an entire aircraft carrier. What you have to get at is what outcomes do you want to change on your aircraft carrier? For instance, you know, a very important system on an aircraft carrier is the elevator that moves the jet fighters from below deck to the runway deck. If that thing goes down, you're not gonna fly a lot of too many airplanes. So is that giving you problems? Is the propulsion system giving you problems? And it's best to isolate and make a, a Pareto, or, you know, a sorted ranked histogram of your top issues and take a look at them and say, what is it that we wanna know? So I could go on and on about just how do you get at what, what piece of information are you trying to get out of a model or a digital twin that changes the game for you? And it's amazing how many people model, and this is true of a lot of work we did with GE Capital, um, where they haven't properly defined a few things that are also sprinkled in here. I will um, jump to like three and four on this list. When you're trying to make a financial decision, and you're basing it on a risk model, and these are very sophisticated math models. Have you ever done the work necessary to say, what's acceptable error? All models have error. They're only models, they're not reality. And most people really can't answer what's acceptable model error. And when you're done with your model and you run it, do you actually understand the error? And I don't even, you know, and then and number five here is, how do you know when a model that's working well has drifted out of error tolerance? And let me drive that last point home because 
a lot of people have heard of the movie The Big Short, which I thought was super representative of what really went on in the years leading up to the financial crisis in 2008. But there's a lesser known movie called Margin Call, which is based on fictional characters, but the story is actually more important than the big short because it's about a fictitious firm that might resemble Goldman Sachs. And within it, they're rocking and rolling with uh, credit default swaps, subprime mortgage lending, and a whole bunch of other exotic derivative instruments that they were making piles of money while their model was intolerant, within error tolerance. But as as crude oil went to over $100 a barrel, and the average family of four had to now make a choice between paying their mortgage or putting gas in the car, they mostly paid the mortgage and charged the gas. I got a view from this within GE as I had a team of people that did a lot of the modeling um, for GE Capital. And so in the movie Margin Call, all of a sudden the firm knows that there is something going tragically wrong as defaults are going crazy left and right through the summer of 2008. And they're really not quite sure what's going on. But they had this quant physicist in the back room who studied and studied and realized that their model assumptions had drifted so far out of tolerance um, that doomsday had already fallen upon them. So again, these are things that I don't think people keep in the front of their mind as they endeavor to build models and digital twins. But again, in in my viewpoint and learning through uh, hard lessons, they turned out to be some of the most important things to keep in mind up front. And the last bullet here, you know, we'll just see how we're doing on time because I'm going to make sure I get through most of what I want by four so we can have uh, some discussion through the last 30 minutes. So now I'll, I'll try to get through it this way. I'll give you, you know, my definition, the definition that evolved within GE of what is a digital twin. And I think a long winded uh, history on how we got there because it didn't happen overnight. And then we'll give the inorganic world examples. And then I'll try to instigate some thought by giving, uh, translating it to a human digital twin example and what, what might that look like. And we'll see how far we get on, you know, hey, you know, digging a little deeper, what are the things you really need to do to build digital twins? And again, you know, you really, I would imagine most people don't know me. Maybe there are a couple of people in this audience that were at my talks at the University of Maryland a couple of years ago. You know, it's interesting. There's been a few terms in my professional life that um, I watch how they evolve and they don't ever wind up with having truly hard definitions. You know, go grab a bunch of artificial intelligence scientists from Stanford Caltech, Carnegie Mellon, and MIT, and see if you could get any two people to agree on the definition of what artificial intelligence is. Um, You can't. I've been there. Um, When it comes to digital twin, it's way worse. All I can tell you from where I sit is uh, we were doing things long before we kind of one of the groups to coin the term But there is a large accreditation to us and what we were doing is kind of the first to really start it as a field um, and and put some meat behind it as an approach and way to solve some industrial problems. And, you know, I don't know if you're familiar with the IEEE, but this is sort of like the top professional organization in the electrical engineering world. And, uh, you know, I've spoken to the equivalent uh, group and sought after by the mechanical engineering world as well. So kind of start at the highest level to make a, the most key point is, you know, what is, what is a digital twin exactly? Well, on the left and GE doesn't own this business, but they built it up from scratch and owned it for a very long time is they built diesel locomotives in Erie, Pennsylvania. And I like to start with that because compared to a lot of other things we were involved in, it's a simpler uh, 
mechanism to a machine to understand. Now, the interesting thing in old Erie, Pennsylvania, and the beautiful, I called it the family business within GE, it was small and everybody knew each other. And it, it, it's not a lot, it wasn't a large business. I mean, by the time we sold it, it was probably a $6 billion a year business, which might seem large, but it was small compared to our power systems and aircraft engine businesses, which are well in excess of 20 billion a year. Within that business, there are only for sale at any given time, just a few model types, I should say product model of a locomotive, just a few. Of course, every time a customer orders one, they get a little customized. But what we would do, for instance, a long time ago, um, you know, about 30 years ago, one, one uh, engine type was uh, on the piston, the top of the piston, the piston crowns, they were breaking. And, um, you know, there it starts. We have a need. We have a field situation which necessitates us to understand why were the piston crowns breaking. And, you know, it could cause a road failure, a track failure of the engine. So what we would do is a lot of root cause analysis, data gathering to try to understand why they were breaking so that we could then build a model of that piston crown. And that model itself does not constitute a digital twin of the piston crown of that uh, model of locomotive. Um, but when we take that model and we take data for a specific engine in, in the field, in the fleet, in a customer's fleet like Norfolk Southern, for each serial number, we instantiate and run that model to see if we think the piston crown is about to break. Each one of those is an individual digital twin. So you look on the left there, I have these numbers, one, two, three, four, five. F within GE, and I was sort of like head census taker in GE for a while as we started this on how many digital twins do we have? And to be counted in our database, you had to meet these five criteria. Each individual asset in the field, whether it was a locomotive, an aircraft engine, an MRI machine, um, each unique serial number could become a digital twin when we ran the data for that specific asset against the model. That's sort of the first thing you got to do. If, if it wasn't built for a business outcome, it didn't count. So in this case, we're trying to prevent road failures. We also, over time, needed our models to continuously learn. I'll try to move this. This thing looks like it'd probably be in your way. Our, our models and our twins have to continually learn. And that learning is so we can fight against that error drift that I talked about. If your model doesn't continuously try to keep up with drift, they go out of date. We have too many of them to manually figure it out. And you, you wind up, say, getting false positives. In other words, things are okay and they're not. We also um, knew that we would be instantiating millions and millions of digital twins across GE and that these things have to scale. The computational intensity of some of what we did is very high and very expensive. And I think people tinker with these things, but when you're instantiating them in large numbers, you will quickly exceed the compute capacity of your internal environment. And um, we have to make the models adaptable because you can't afford at um, a development time that used to run 18 to 24 months for every single subsystem, you'll never keep up. So we had to learn how to build things and say, okay, as we take that piston crown system modeling model from one engine, as we create the next model of the engine, I should say the next product, how much can we reuse? You don't start from scratch. Um, I want, I'm gonna just pause there in case anybody says, I really don't understand what you just said is the definition of a digital twin. Is there anybody 
or, or wants to refute it and say the model itself is a digital twin, because I think that actually is how what most people think is a digital twin is the model itself. No, I think what you've enunciated is pretty close to what the majority here would think of. I mean, some of the terminology may be slightly different. In other words, your business outcome might be a medical outcome. Exactly. Like dealing yep. with uh, septic shock and design, wanting to understand how to apply an anti, anti-inflammatory to prevent septic shock. Uh, so some of these, but, but, and the continuous learning I'd love to come back to because this idea of predictor corrector and continuously self-tuning models is something that uh, we find very intriguing and would love to learn more about. All right, I'm glad you asked because I kind of had that in the appendix a little bit. And let's make sure after four, bring that back and I'll bring out some of that material to show you at least in the inorganic world, what we actually do there for learning, okay? I I had a question. Sure. Um, For the continuously learning, is that for within a digital twin or does it pull from other digital twins? It can be either. Okay. Maybe I should jump, you know, this, I think, I think the pre-warning, if I go down this path, we might spend the rest of the session on continuous learning. I have another question though. Sure. Uh, which is, so it seems like there is a certain class of models. So it's not like the space of all possible models, right? Right. In other words, be outcome based. You know, I never got, you know, you know, the, we did a lot of meetings and interaction and thought, you know, sessions with the Navy. Um, and, you know, I would have loved to driven that drive that one um, to ground a little more and really force them to show me, I call it the Pareto of pain, right? Very, you know, much different exercise within GE. All these business divisions would come to us for to help on these problems. And, you know, I would always say, and they have this data, they just may not have done much with it, which is, let me just see your field, um, your field reports, right? Let's build a simple histogram and then sort it from highest bar on the left, the Pareto, I'm not sure everybody's always familiar with that. And let's see, you know, it might be, I remember this one year, you know, on our MRI and CT machines, going back 20 years, the biggest problem were the power supplies, right? Until I really dug, you know, like they wanted us to do some sophisticated monitoring and diagnostics. I'm I'm like, it's very expensive, going to take a long time. What, what's costing us warranty money, right? So let's just figure out what models would help us understand, A, when a power supply might go down in a hospital or medical facility, and then B, let's get together with engineering and redesign either a fix or put something in the next version of the product that eliminates that. You you know, does that kind of help a little bit? Right. So then that means that depending on, so the very same physical asset so say this this uh, rail, uh, this locomotive. Um, at one point in the business, it's it's in it's in working use, and you would have a certain digital twin. And then at another point in its life cycle, it's something that needs to be disassembled and disposed of and and stripped for spare parts. You might have a completely different digital twin because the 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 business outcomes are different. Is that correct? Yeah, I, you know, the certainly these products go through a decades long life cycle. Um, you know, I would say we always understand what is our deployed fleet. So again, if we were to look back at locomotives, said so there's just a few product numbers out there. Um, that world doesn't change very much. That's why I, I use it in deeper tutorials and examples. But again, it just, you know, you release... You know, a big thing that drives that world um, is emissions control. It's one of the lesser regulated industries, right? You could imagine our our medical imaging machines, FDA, super regulated, aircraft engines, FAA, super hyper mega <laughs> uh, regulated. And a lot of what you do is to meet regulatory um, 
standards, which are good, right? They're good for the general public. It wasn't so much in Locomo, but you know, you you had an EPA that said, you know, it's a diesel exhaust machine. And so what would happen is really what drove a lot of our new product uh, generations in a locomotive were you have to lower emissions and you're always striving to get better fuel efficiency. So we don't need to model, let's just listen, we don't need a digital twin of the entire locomotive. We really just break it down. And maybe I'll just go to this chart. All right. The, if we looked at, at, you know, about the time I retirement two years ago, as I said, as the chief census taker on how many twins has GE built, here was the number. And the large majority kind of goes from left to right. were just on individual parts. So what you're actually looking at here could be a couple of things. You can't tell from this photo. I know what it is, but um, this is a disc, Right. When you're flying either in an airplane or a gas turbine generating electricity, this is the core of the machine. You know, if it's in an aircraft engine, um, there's only about four entities in the world that can make this nickel-based super alloy. That's one of the materials. You never want a disc failure. And then these individual blades, you see they're called dovetails and they get inserted in these slots. So this would just be, say, one stage of the actual either the hot or colder section of the gas turbine. And we're really going to build a lot of models because when I go back, I'll show you the things we want to know. So by the way, you, this could also be the actual flywheel inside a locomotive. All right. could have been that. And maybe if we're having flywheel problems, cracking problems, we might just concentrate on that. You know, things that were some generally problematic were cooling systems in a locomotive. Um, the traction motor, you know, the, it's actually, it's interesting. Diesel locomotives were like a Toyota Prius uh, long before there was a Toyota Prius, right? It's kind of like a one to three megawatt power plant with a generator, right? That powers electric motors on the bottom that the wheels are attached to. Those are called the traction motor. So you got to monitor those. Um, and, you, and so you build up parts, but over time, as you start to assemble more part and subsystems, it starts to constitute more of a product, you know, overall product type twin, All right? And here's an old steam turbine photo. Interestingly enough, you know, and then you string enough of them together. This is a, a two gas turbine combined cycle power plant, sort of like the top level schematic. This large thing here is actually a big heat exchanger, takes the exhaust heat off the gas turbine and then uses it to boil water that will actually turn a steam generator over here, right? And that's why it's combined cycle. It combines the gas and a steam cycle to give you power. One of these is about 550 megawatts. So it'll do roughly a half a million homes. And we got very good. We got up over time. We were able to build these because, uh, and I show you other examples, it, you know, we can help the customer get much more value by learning how to control this thing and when, when to run it hot, when to run it cold, when to run it slightly above its limits, it'll survive. But on those peak days in July and August, you can make so much more money selling onto the grid than the part, cost of the parts you might consume faster. And then I don't want to talk too much about process twins because they have really nothing to do with the medical world, but we actually did this with supply chains. So any other questions before we move on? I'm not sure process isn't very relevant in some of the things that we're looking at be. because we're interested in dynamics and the control of dynamic systems as, as well. Right. As Hence the multi-scale too. Right. So let me move some stuff out of the way. I just things I don't love about. How's that? All right. So I told you I was going to give you, I think what I'm about to spend a lot of time on here, though, will help you on your journey of, again, figuring out what questions do you need to answer, aka the outcomes, by going through a progression of just understanding what can you ask. So here we go, right? And on the bottom here, 
is sort of also a progression of what I would call kind of the AI and statistical sophistication that started happening. So long ago, when I was a little boy in GE, right, the 1980s, it really started in that locomotive business in a lot of ways. Back in about the, the mid-1980s, a locomotive had a mean time of failure, between failure, of only 45 days. Imagine if your car broke in some way, you had to call the dealer every 45 days. If you lived in New York, you'd invoke the Lemon Law and you'd get get a new one. Um, it's, a, you know, the closest thing to understand is like a tank, you know, weight-wise, power-wise, and vibration-wise. But customers would call and the thing is already broken. And all we really had at our disposal was we were just trying to build m and is a monitoring diagnostic system that answered the question, what happened? We're just, it's already broken. We're trying to figure out why it's broken so we could figure out who to send and what to send them with to get that locomotive running again. And, you know, the AI technology was what we would call just, you know, if then rule based was the state of the art. But you know what? In, we learned in the second half of the, of the 80s to do that really well. And by the um, 1990s, it started to occur to us that we could start asking the question, what is happening? All right. Now, notice what's, what's going to happen here in these series of questions in each column is we are able to move the time constant of the question. That's really what's going on here. So we realized, boy, the customers would love love it so much more if we could keep track of what's happening to their locomotive or their aircraft engine so that instead of them calling us, we call them and say, hey, look, we think the machine um, is starting to decline either in performance or it's approaching a failure. Can we come out and fix it? And we got so good at this in the first half of the 90s that nearly every GE business that had, you know, um, a service department with assets in the field built a center. And, you know, I think of our medical systems business, you know, right. What was uh, communications then? POTS, plain old telephone system. We were going to hospitals and we were asking to put in a phone line for every machine. And we were downloading data to a central center to start keeping our eye on the machine so we could see its health. And by the turn of the century, we moved one, one more tick closer on that time continuum and say, hey, what is going to break next? Let's give more early warning. And then, you know, by 10 years later, we were actually, and this is the key, is this is a lot of modeling discussion. Here's what went on, right? I said, Back here in the 90s, we had telephony. By 2010, we had ubiquitous wireless coverage on a large part of the country and the planet so that we could get much more frequent and much higher fidelity data. Therefore, our models were much more accurate, which much lower error. And we were able to start selling service agreements based on telling customers, we want to get to zero failures with you, zero failures you see. And that ultimately led by 2015, GE deciding to put the money uh, and invest in, you know, even further in the, in the time continuum. Hey, like I, the combined cycle, but can we run this hotter? Can you do it without wrecking the machine? Um, and as you'll see in the next few charts, hey, when should I do my maintenance? Because a big part of this is moving from schedule-based maintenance to condition-based maintenance. Now, I'm, I'm a big, you know, kind of, I love using cars as a translating uh, device here because, you know, most people own them and, you, you know, you at least go get your car's oil change, right? So if you've owned a car through the last 40 years, you've seen how maintenance has changed, right? General rule of thumb, you bring your car in every 3,000 miles or three months and get all Good practice. I always did it. I never had an engine failure. But 
you know, cars of the last 20 years and uh, all my, you know, my cars now tell me this, it tells you the remaining useful life. And, you know, with synthetic oil and stuff, I can get 8,000 miles between service intervals just on the oil change. When you look at, the, you know, how many ass engines, you know, a, a company like FedEx or Southwest Airlines owns, that's a lot of money. Now, for GE, we moved from going to an event-based payment system of, you know, or transactional, meaning, hey, when we service your piece of equipment, we send you a bill. Just like, you know, all of us generally, once the car's out of warranty, you pay per visit and whatever the work is. We learned, if we remember that prior column chart with the decades on it, we really moved away from that and customers loved paying by unit of usage. So our aircraft engine customers pay us by flight hour or so for every flight hour, they get charged a certain amount and then we get profit, right? By collecting that money for the amount they use an asset minus the cost of service. So what happens for us is we have to figure out how to reduce the cost to retain more profit while satisfying the service level agreement. And one way you do that is reduce the frequency. So digital twins for us are also about knowing, right? And, you know, I use this in my Baltimore thing. I got very provocative, right? It could be risky what I, what I say here, but, you know, when you really just think about an aircraft engine or a power plant, we are God for that inorganic object. We designed it. We have the CAD drawings. We know the physics and we birth it. We build it. We commission it. And now we own the maintenance risk. So we kind of need to, you know, it's on us to know everything we can. And the more you know, the smarter you can be and the more you can reduce the, the cost of service. So that's what drove us to do these things. So here's an example with an aircraft engine and what you see here. So this is what we call kind of the continuous prediction example. Every day we get flight data from all our engines that have flown a flight. And in this particular case, this here is a part, it's called a shroud. There's a ring of these that um, go around each row of turbine blades. They protect the tips of the blades. And they also, you know, together form a, com you know, a vessel for containment of the, of the um, basically the exhaust gases that get formed by combustion. You'll see here, each little dot here is one particular engine. And it's really one particular twin of the shroud system of a particular stage of the engine. That's the level of fidelity. And what we see is there is two populations that emerge. This nice lower one in which when the service interval comes out, the shrouds look pretty good. And then we have the other one which is these are engines that were flying in the hot and harsh environment that's generally the swath of geography across Northern Africa through the Middle East and then takes a Northeastern swing through China where th they have uh, particulate matter under 10 microns in their environment from things they burn in those areas of the world that our engines suck in and clog these little cooling holes in the shroud and lead to this decay. So here's a prime example of, as this particular engine was flying, this model of engine, and it's, unfortunately I keep using the word model, but it's probably confusing. As this particular product type flew, we saw these populations emerge and realize we had to figure out why. And when we figured out, it's called PM10, particulate matter under 10 microns, Right, and it's things like sulfur and, and magnesium in the atmosphere there. But now, building a digital twin of every instantiating a serial number, right, for a particular engine, and running that model, now we're tracking the cumulative, you know, breakdown on each particular one. And here's the line at which we need to now inspect or replace by this time so that we don't go above it and wind up with some kind of failure out there. That makes sense? I mean, I think your point is beautifully taken 
because medicine fails all of these. And I'm sure when you talk about medical digital twins, you'll come back to it. Medicine is reactive. Right. It's open loop. It's based on prescription of treatment rather than an outcome. Mm-hmm. And so all of the things that you've identified as the critical deliverables of digital twins, medicine fails. It's, people are going to think you. I paid you to say this because of what I'm going to show you next. So, like I said, I had this, you know, really fun career, I'll put it that way, where I just got to work in both worlds. So now let's go to healthcare and how this might translate. And I'll bring it back to the automobile, right? To your very point, here's the difference in what I'll call diagnostics between people and automobiles. Now, I I find, you know, when I talk to medical people, um, they seem somewhat offended that I'm comparing what they do to fixing a car. But I think you'll get the point in a minute, right? When, right, how do we think about how you take care of yourself versus how you take care of your car or how you, you know, your doctor take care of you versus how, you know, you have the money to buy. And I, you know, I have nice cars from nice dealerships and they tell me when they come in now. They tell me when they come in based on data. I have my cars, I get a report every month tell me my engine oil left, my air filter left, my brakes, and it's very accurate, right? For us, you know, oh, honey, did you get your, did you schedule your checkup with the doctor this year yet, right? Maybe they remind you, maybe they don't, right? And your car tells you this today, right? You hope, you know, your doctor, I I, uh, I try to take good care of myself. As Mickey Mantle said, if I knew I was going to live this long, I would have taken much better care of myself. But I've learned to do a better job, and I keep all the data on me I can because I learned long ago to have a cardiologist at an early age, story we don't have time for. And it's paid good fruit, Um, and he has good data. But it's discreet, maybe twice a year. And, you know, this picture in the background, I don't know if people know what this is. This is under your dashboard, this plug. This is called the ODB2 sensor kit. You can go to Napa, Advanced Auto Parts, or any of them for 20 bucks, buy a gadget, a gadget that plugs in here, and then you know download the app for that, that company's product and watch your phone get populated with all the data you should have on you, not just your car, right? This has all sorts of temperatures, pressures, RP, everything and anything you could imagine. Why don't we have that for people? Right? And... You know, I'm, I'm, you know, at that age, so is my wife. Um, we met our deductible already because she had one surgery. So now, um, you know, it's a be- you know, I'm going to the buffet all I can for the rest of the year. And sure enough, right, I need a, a, about two or three surgeries. And I got like two months lead time now to get the first appointment to tell me I need surgery. Your car, right? It's actually usually a couple of days, no more than a week to fix nearly any problem. What? Are, how, why are we treating the inorganic devices better than we treat ourselves? That's that's the provocative um, statement here. So, you know, to to the prior point made, right? You know, here's how we do it today for machines, and we do it for our car, right? We have a lot more sensing. What built-in sensors do people have? Um, and from that, we can do this long range prediction. What's going to break next? How much remaining useful life? All right. Then we can actually optimize the performance of the machine based on its state. And then we know when to inspect it. Sometimes you got to take a physical and when to do a repair and upgrade. Here's, here's how it looks for most of us. We, uh, we have to self sense. You know, honey. I don't seem to have, uh, I seem to get short of breath a lot more, right? And you either ignore it or you self-treat it. You know, you, maybe your doctor will give you a butyrol, something you think you have asthma or something, right? And treat. And then, you know, finally, we might ex- inspect by the doctor, you know, and that's that loop. Why, you know, my dream, had I been able to work for many more years, is, uh, you know, a fellow named James Rothman, uh, a physiologist from Yale, won the Nobel Prize for Medicine about seven or eight years ago. I used to sit next to him. And um, 
I brought these ideas to him a long time ago, and I just didn't want to make the career change, but I actually got funded to build uh, an in situ device in humans to start to do this. So that's a way out there thought. And one thing we did do 20 years ago is we built something that Intel sells today called Quiet Care. It's actually finally after 12 years in the field, the second gen, and I'm not involved. But we just took these basic door sensors and motion centers and put them in homes in 20 different elder couples, the utensil draw, pressure sensors on the bed. Just imagine no one, the toilet opener closing, the fridge door. And we built models of their behavior. And we learned that the pattern kind of plays out over a month. Why on the third Wednesday of every month did they go out the front door and come back an hour later? Well, the social security check had come and they went to go put it in the bank, right? That day looked like an anomaly at first, but really speeding up an incredible story. And we were able to build something that ultimately got sold to living assisted homes because they really can't keep up with even tracking the people they have living there. Um, so I don't have a lot of time to go through the math on this, but that's sort of one thought. Again, being mindful of about five minutes to go, come and keep in this kind of human thought. Here's what's much more challenging. You know, I say this like it'd be easy. We don't have the blueprints on people, but the you know the cars we we know the physics. So much about people is still unknown, right? These transfer functions are are the differentiating factor. We we know the physics for machines. We don't know them. Um, you know, at best to replace human parts. You know, we're starting to what print organs and things, ears and other stuff. Um, we'll use the you know we make the materials on the machines. There's just a lot more confounding factors in trying to diagnose people, and it makes the modeling certainly far different. I mean, far more challenging. As I as I've you know beat up, we just don't have. We don't not only have the sensor data, the frequency is just so sparse, um, you know, it's, it's barely useful for monitoring people. Machines, you know, we can, on an aircraft, then on a, on a gas turbine, we can get 325 parameters once a second if we want it. Um, you know, machines, as I said, when we looked at that shroud problem, well, we actually, our models include what the environmental conditions are for every engine on every flight it goes on. So we know exactly how much PM10 it was exposed to. We know very little about what people actually get exposed to. Um, and people are just, um, and, and the machines are much more terministic. So people are more unique than machines. It's harder to get at, but hopefully, you know, this provocative thought has you thinking a little bit. Um, but we could do more biometrics. And as I said, the thing I always want, I've been wanting to do for nearly 10 years and just trying to get somebody else to do it now because I desperately need this device uh, to predict heart attacks and strokes. Mind you, I've already had a stroke. Um, you know, DNA is, is the thing that'll get us the CAD models, the original blueprints. Um, and then I think all of you are, you know, I wouldn't say the virus is disease, you know, but we're trying to do more prediction about things like viruses. Imagine, you know, uh, stopping a heart attack or, you know, it would get dicey with the Olympic committee though, and <laughs> optimizing human performance. You know, I think another thing is we could probably do a lot more against the opioid epidemic, if not a pandemic with some devices like this. And uh, you have that now it's, it, I think, just about top of the hour with a half hour to go. Maybe I'll just do this. So I'll kind of make this my last slide and we'll go to discussion. You know, from my practitioner's point of view, I, I explained a lot of this already, but you know, when I went to NASA and all these other entities that wanted help on where to get started, the first activity is, you know, let's look at what the outcome changes are that you need and prioritize in a way that's, you know, kind of pain point versus cost to defeat that. 
um, you know, cost has to be considered and what it's going to take to get to the goal line, to the goal line. Then you can start your modeling. And then you also need to really understand that there's a, there's a term here, feeds the model, right? For us, you don't just build the model. When you deploy a model of an aircraft engine with that, you know, tracking that condition of that shroud, and you're tracking it on 34,000 engines, you have to build the, a team that can feed the data to those models and run them on some you know, reasonable frequency. Now, when you build the model, all right, once you get through steps one and two and three, and now you really start getting closer to building the model, you ha do have to ask yourself, now, what data do you need to build it? And if we're talking about AI types of models, you got to train the model and validate it. And, you know, maybe another thing I, I should put in here, most of the time, we don't have the, you know, when we really understand things at this point, we don't really have the data we wish to have. And that usually, it, you know, an industry brings up a major decision point, which is we can't really build a model to get the outcome we need with the budget we have, uh, with the data we have, and we can't afford to build a new sensor. You know, sometimes you just move on and you say, we're not going to build that one yet. Let's move to the next outcome or bar in that Pareto chart and see if we can fix that one. Too many people chase the big elephant and never kill it because they just can't face into, you just don't have the data fidelity or frequency or accuracy you need to complete this. I mentioned earlier, um, if you're going to deploy this in large numbers, now I'm thinking, imagine having some set of the human body modeled and we're now instantiating, let's call the serial number, our social security numbers. And maybe we're, you know, maybe just say a really small segment, 5 million people. Well, you got to start facing, you say, and we're going to get there, but now we're going to run it on 5 million people a day. You better um, look at your compute budget for processing time that you'll need and, and how long it takes models to run and give you the answers. This is, it's amazing the amount of time and money spent getting here. And then the thing flops because this was never addressed. And I will say that, you know, Amazon Web Services alone will probably get you a long, long way in defeating this problem now. But that wasn't true 15 years ago. And you have to, again, you, you know, for us, a big part of it is, can you build a process that operationalizes a digital twin in a way that you get your answers? So let me, that's, that's a lot, I think, information and material in an hour. So let's uh, move to questions and discussions. Well, I wish I had, I wish I could buttonhole you for hours on this. Uh, but but I need to I, I I've already asked some questions. Richard asked a question, but I should I should leave the floor open because I I, I don't want to be a monopolist. But I have a, I have plenty. So if there are no if, 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 once other people have said their say, I have a lot of questions. Uh, so Rusty, I have a question. This is Ryan Lowenbacher. Um, since you um, addressed this resource issue um, seven or eight years ago, I. Um, attended uh, an event by GE in, in New York. It was the rollout of the Predix platform. Uh, and um, and so, so that's sort of essentially the uh, um, uh, data processing uh, part that takes incoming data and processes them and feeds them to your digital twins. Um, based on what was said there, it seemed that um, GE invested about a billion dollars in, in building that platform. Am I way off in my estimate? No, no, you're not. And now, you know, I'm retired two years. Um, it is when you retire, uh, you know, it, you'd be surprised. It, I was surprised, right? You know, you're just cut off. So I can't comment on where that is today. But that was the plan. I mean, it, w it was a well-motivated plan. Um, whole nother topic that I'm actually probably under written agreement not to discuss. 
Thank you. Hey, I'd like to jump in with a question. I thought that was really interesting. Um, I thought what you said about the financial crisis was particularly intriguing, right? Is how can you tell when your model isn't working? And I think that's highly relevant to things like a pandemic. Nobody knew what SARS-CoV-2 was going to do to the human body. And I think any model that we had used from another virus would have gotten it wrong. But I'd like to make that getting it wrong a, a mo the most useful we can, that is to learn from it and improve it. Do you have any thoughts about how we deal with novelty in this context? Yeah, uh, I wish I had a, uh, I wish, Frederick, I wish I had a great answer for you. Because I had one of my five criteria to be a twin, right? Adaptable. And yeah, you know, novel here really, again, I have enough, say, on the job medical knowledge to be useful and sometimes dangerous. And I'd have to explain so much to my family about this, what that meant. Um, you know, I, I guess the best we can do is, right, you take some of what I've presented here. And if you at least know that, where to start, right? So if I think about like how my mind went crazy last March, that's when I faced into this reading, just consumed by anything I could find. But also knowing, you know, I understand that the amount of years it will take to answer so many questions because so much of what I presented to you is based on time series data, right? And when it's novel with so many unknowns, like for us, if it's, you know, if we make a new engine and it's basically a derivative of the last one, we can artificially create a lot of time series data. You know, that's stuff people don't like to do. Um, there's nothing glorious about it, but man, is it useful. Um, I don't know, I'm just thinking out loud right now, is one thing that helps you when you're in the ambiguous thing, right, is Monte Carlo simulation, right? Building things that could generate data to take you to scenarios you, you just can't enumerate by yourself, right? You start gathering data on the models you have and look for the outlying clusters and see what starts to look interesting would be one maybe way to go. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, that's what I do. Yeah, it's just if, you know, if you have this technology set up for a person, which I'm highly skeptical of for the many reasons you laid out, and let's say we could use it to deal with influenza, which is, you know, familiar and for which we do have some time series, pathetic as they are, you know, the, how would you go about twinning that, you know, modifying that? For, for a new virus? Well, you know, if all the smart people died, unfortunately, and they said, well, you're the only guy we have left to do this, and I had to do it, I would, my in my feeble mind, I would start with, what do we know, right? What is, I would say, so let's just, let's just take COVID, right? It seemed in the beginning, the main thing it attacked was the respiratory system. I mean, that was my observation. Maybe it wasn't, but I just seem like, man, the people that are the sickest are the people having trouble breathing. Okay, so now I want to take everything we know about respiratory system and ways it can be hurt and now start to look at this virus and start to understand how it's, you know, penetrating our defense system, you know, our body's immune system. How does it get through? And where is it going to start to attack so that we could start theorizing on, you know, A, I mean, in the beginning, usually we don't go for the cure. We go for symptom control. I mean, I just right in the beginning, it was like, geez, what the heck do we give people and what apparatus do we put them on? You know, we put them on a ventilator just to keep them alive till we have a treatment. And, you know, because in the beginning, I just think you got to buy yourself time. While we do the harder job, which is stamp out the disease. Does that make sense? I mean, and that's just, again, not being a physiologist, doctor, or anything close to that. I, I just, that's how I would start. You know, I, I do get, I did get pregnant a lot of time in areas I knew nothing about, but because, right, there's a systematic way you solve these problems. And I just get on the whiteboard with people and say, what war are we fighting? 
Who's the enemy? What do we got to defeat? Okay, what do we know? What do we have at our disposal? And, and, and build a plan. And that's kind of the best you could do in the lack of knowing. But, you know, it, it, a big thing, right, in R&D is we, I always kept every year in the groups I ran my labs, tell me your, your top five to ten research problems you're going to solve this year. If you can't formulate the problem, I don't know what you're spending time and money doing. Right. And, and so I think you start there. What is the problem we're trying to solve? Right. In fact, what's the outcome we want to do better at? And I'll stop there. But yeah, I mean, I just say one other thing. It's just, you know, the famous Rumsfeld quote about the unknown unknowns. And I want right. to think about how to use models to be open minded about those. You know, my concern when this whole idea was broached within the context of this working group was a certain arrogance that we know enough to really delimit what the immune system is doing. And I think that is absolutely false today and will remain so for decades. But if we're open minded to the unknown unknowns and use modeling as a way to find those and identify them, that's where I want this to go. That's just my personal. It's a, it's a great thought. And I love that you mentioned unknown unknowns, right? Those are certainly the things that kept me up, you know, at night is, yeah, you know, we would keep lists, right? You know, spread whatever database, you know, we're very good at catalogs of the models, the known knowns, you know, the, the thing is, and, you know, with machines, some of, you know, we, we have great product successes where, you know, we had some engines that so far exceeded our legacy statistics on how long things should last that it, it caused accounting problems. Let me put it that way for us, um, because you can't really recognize revenue till you have a service event. You know what I mean? So but now all of a sudden they're coming in, but they're not coming in for the reasons you used to see because they were unknown unknowns. You know, maybe a big part of it is, you know, you got to have the early warning system that starts to tell you when you're having new problems, right? And, you know, it's hard enough with machines, but they're easier to censor than the human body. You know, I had in my chart, right, you know, until you have the ache or pain or performance deficiency in your life, you don't know whether anything's really wrong. And most people ignore it. I want to follow up on that because I thought, what you just said was fascinating, and I thought Fred's question was always was very penetrating, which is, if you see a if you have a model that you expect to work and you see a divergence that you don't expect, that's a warning that something is happening. Yeah, it can be. It, I wondered if you had a good industrial example. You have this great example of flying in in areas with high particulates and low particulates, and how different the the law, the damage curves were. Was there an industrial model that you had that worked very well? And there was some change of use, some change of environment. And suddenly that industrial model stopped working. And that was an indication that there was something that was missing from the model or changing in the environment that you had to address in an industrial setting. Yeah, well, uh, let me take the easier case, which is, you know, that this whole, we called it hot and harsh PM10, right? 30 years ago, you didn't have to deal with this. You know, it's really a phenomenon in the last couple of decades as other regions of the world, particularly China, gets more industrialized, right? So it didn't exist. So no one accounted for it. Right? These machines, believe me, they work way beyond design spec. They're amazing. But you can't always predict, you know, no one, no one sat in the design meetings going, well, what if there were higher concentrations of magnesium at 10,000 feet, right? Why would anybody think that? But good practice, right, on, you know, having a great service division is when the people in the maintenance shops start to see peculiar things, if you can get them sensitized to never be afraid to show us a problem. And, in the, you know, you got to have smart people on the leadership team that are starting to notice, you know, they have the acuity to notice, yeah, this is different. Why? Why? Um so that's, you know, that there was no mathematical control. There might have started been an accounting control, which is like, you know, we're, you know, these parts, they're under a warranty of sorts and our costs are going up much more because we're replacing that part more than predicted. 
Why? That may cause a call to the shop. Hey, by the way, when you inspect these, are you noticing any damage? You know, so th- th- there's got to be some mechanisms in there. You know, I think about like, so who are the equivalent of those frontline technicians in a man, right? It, it, is it your general practitioner? You know, who's seeing it? And how does that data get aggregated? At least in a single company where there's a lot of financial outcome at stake, it kind of happens. What's the response time from when problems actually started till we actually are, are the AMA is a completely alerted to it? I have no idea. I bet it's longer though than an industrial setting. So you're you're talking about human flag waivers. Yeah. I, I was asking the question whether your simulation, your oh. digital twins themselves couldn't wave flags. In other words, there's a change say in gasoline additives for the airplane engine. Right. And suddenly you see that your lifetime predictions aren't right anymore. And it was a change that was made because people didn't think it was significant. And then your 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 twin itself can flag a problem. Is, do you have is there any example you could give us of that kind of where the twin itself by seeing a divergence from expected behavior was able to flag an issue? Uh, that wasn't you know, good. I would say I tapped out at about the time that was going to be one of the next research areas. I, I would not purport at, at the time uh, I left in 2019 that it's on the drawing board. We knew we have to get there. We have to do better at like where I started. When do we know the model has drifted or the performance of the machine has drifted that, you know, the model isn't really helping us as much anymore. You know, I would say our overall operational process helps us find that sooner. But I think, you know, back to the viral pandemics, right? You know, what what is the mechanism by which the metal community starts to really realize we have something new we should care about? And, you know, just in my personal life experience, I don't, I don't think it's a shock to anybody but, you know, the incidence of type 2 diabetes is higher than it used to be. It seems autism is at a higher rate than it used to be. Um, you know, and I bet all of you can name five other things. You know, some of it is, you know, the emerging islands problem. Well, people live longer. The old problems have been defeated. So you live longer. Now you see the problems you get when you're in your 80s. But I think for, you know, but let's if we look at people that are experiencing disease and illness before 50, pick a number like that, there's lots of things that seemingly are cropping up. You know, within cancer, multiple myeloma seems to be a much higher disease at a much younger age than when my mother died from it in 1993. She was an outlier, all right? A 52-year-old female Caucasian. That's not so anymore, all right? So what is the trigger, right? Some Something's out of whack. Something's changed environmentally, dietarily, something like that. What's our early warnings? You know, think about early warning systems. I guess I would say, you know, stream of consciousness. If I really look at a lot of what I talked about causes a lot of operational changes in a company. And I guess we would just say there was an overall early warning system that kind of just arises from the fact that we have to be way more vigilant than we used to be about knowing earlier when there are new problems, the unknown unknown has now became a known problem. So I have, I have a question kind of going back to, I think something Richera might have been alluding to. And, and I guess it's the, the use of um, mass data versus N of one. And that, you know, we're, we're kind of stuck with distribution curves of experience and there's tails on the curves. And that's not really very useful in the digital twin concept. I mean, it's there, uh, you watch it, that's where you're gonna maybe see drift that, that this is not just one thing changing, but in fact, the average is changing. But the real answer still comes back to that one individual person and what's going on with them. And, and then just some of the other kind of um, 
you know, you, you get a model that's not working very well, you stop selling them and you take them offline and send them to the junkyard. Well, <laughs> when I'm not working very well, I'm not going to be real happy to find out that the <laughs> digital twin model says I'm not economically viable anymore. So you're going to shoot me. So, so there's a lot of other things associated with the potential. And then kind of the, my last question is, suppose, suppose we set out to find a group of people to go off somewhere very interdisciplinary and say, what would be the roadmap to human digital twin 2050? 30 years from now, it ain't going to happen before that entering assumption could be wrong. But you say, if we want it to be there 30 years from now, where do we start? You know, where, what has to happen first? Do we have to have more models first? Or do we need to, do we need to spend half of the investment for the next 10 years just in new sensors? Because now there's a sensor I can, I can rub on my arm and it sticks there and it'll give continuous um, blood pressure and oxygen level and a half a dozen other things, continuous sensing. Well, you know, if, if I'm just doing heart modeling, um, that's a great step. But what are the other things that we would have to have? You know, how do we how do we get over them building what we can because we think we know how and we can and get on to identifying the three or four most important things that need to get built that we don't know how to do yet, but that's where you got to spend the money first because if you don't do that, it's going to be 2090 before you come up with the solution. So, so could such a group be worked on as a as well you a, could commission anybody to do any of that john mm -hmm. i you know here's how i feel about it though so you get said 12 people away on a retreat for three days and they're going to do this three weeks you know, what a, you know <laughs> who do they represent and who's sanctioned it and if you sent 12 other people what would they come up because it, again this notion of a human digital twin I, I would start with what do we want it to tell us? And then that could be a lot of different things. So how do you prioritize which ones are going to go to? Uh, you know, I think it's a good time for me to give my little 90 second soliloquy. I used a lot that kind of paints that picture. And you've heard that because I think I started my presentation this way in Maryland. So if you were there, you've heard this before. It goes like this. And I, and I came up with this on the spot at the, like the first conference an exhibit I ever kind of rolled out digital twin at. And I gave my long winded engineering view of an aircraft and, and the reporter walked away. He was baffled. I realized I better turn that around. And I did this. I go, what if from the minute you were born, you came out of your mom's womb, we could collect once a second, your body temperature, your O2, your cholesterol, and every other biometric uh, piece of data that you get maybe once a year from your doctor, right? Your blood pressure. Just imagine you got that once a second for the rest of your life. And we knew once a second, we got all the environmental conditions. We got the temperature. We got the humidity level, the barometric, everything, uh, particulates in the air. And we had all this. And, and then we know the work you did. In other words, your calorie, we know the amount you exercise we, because we see your heart rate. We have all this incredible, just imagine data was free and collecting it was free and you lived your life. And then one day you're at five guys and you're 50 years old. And man, you know, you've been good for like a week and you're like, oh, this is, this is a, uh, this is cheat day. And I'm going to have the double cheeseburger and the large fry. <laughs> and the and the large chocolate shake. And you're sitting there. And the burger is just about here. And your cell phone goes off. Hello? 
Rusty, this is your digital twin. Put the cheeseburger down. One more bite in its coronary history for you. See, for me, that was years ago what I thought I, a digital twin should do. Imagine mm-hmm. having that digital twin that was sort of your guardian and, and told you not to do things that, you know, as I use my Mickey Mantle quote, would not have me saying at this age, I would have uh, taken better care of myself. So that, that, but that's just one man's view, what a digital twin means to me. But I would also like it to, you know, to say, you're going to get this disease. You're genetically disposed. And you could turn that alert on and off, by the way. I'm in the smaller class of people, I guess, that I, you know, I've had some, my father died of a horrific brain disease called Friedrich's ataxia. And I might get it too, but I don't want to get the test and know. I like not knowing some things, okay? Believe it or not, is I don't want to change it. But some people do. And should your twin tell you that or not? So I just say, you know, if you ask your doctor, doctor probably has a completely different view. Oh, I wish I had a digital twin every one of my patients because it would do these things for me and I could take care of more patients and have a bigger caseload and charge less or make more. But how do you know? How do you know what's right? Well, you mentioned something that in one of your slides that you didn't get back to, which was that in humans, you can't be scientific because you can't do a control experiment. You can't evaluate treatment options in medicine because you can't do and not do a treatment on the same patient. If you have a digital yeah. twin that's a good predictive for a particular set of situations and i would not ever talk about a whole digital twin of a whole patient but of a right. specific system uh, in cardio they do this now a lot there's a model a, a, a template model of the heart it's personalized from mri and other kinds of data for an individual patient and then a cardiologist goes in and says if i do this surgery see what happens if i do this surgery see what happens if i do this surgery see what happens and so your digital twin allows you to do counterfactual optimization and personalization that is very hard to do otherwise. But one thing that I could say is missing from your list of things that are different is that you don't say that in, in, in human biomedicine, we don't have a description of what the interventions are yet. We don't have a list of the possible interventions that we could apply in your engineered system. You have a better sense of we can do this. Whereas in the humans, we don't have a list of things that we could do that are described in a computable way that we could test. And I wondered, those are two sort of different thing, comments or questions, but I wondered if you had a- And they're great. And I'm humbled by them because, you know, I don't have an answer for other than, but you see, remember I go back to, so those sounds like big research questions. You see, you're, you're getting at the, here's what we need, right? Here's, here's, you know, or my list of what are our encumbrances that are keeping us from doing what we want to do. I mean, you, you know, that's an interest. that's a sophisticated word for me, encumbrances, but I want to know them because I had to figure out, can, can I overcome them? And if I think I can, that, that sounds like a research program to me, right? And it's a research program till we solve it. And then it's, and, it, and then we hand that to engineering and then they use it to build and fix things. And that's always the difference to me between science and engineering, right? Science is just the, this, of trying to do experiments to understand what exists, right? Fundamentally, generally always broken down into math. And then when we understand it, it's knowledge. And then engineering can do something with it. But you got to have, I think there's great, great points. And it, they said, shows my lack of depth on the medical side of not even contemplating that, right? In engineering, you know, we know we're going to break some things on purpose. That's all right. We, we have design failures to learn from. You can't do that with people unless they volunteer. And even then, we don't allow it. But as modelers, you know, the question is, where does the model come in? The, the vision that you laid out of from birth to death, continuous data stream available if you turn it on, that's, that's had nothing to do with models. That's sensors. Well, you're filling a database that you can query to at least understand state. Right. Because and as so I then, mentioned, in healthcare, we don't even really know state. How many does any, I right. actually know the answer to this question. All of you, 
some amongst those left in this call have some amount of blockage in their heart. Yep. I get it measured. That's why I have a cardiologist. My last one was 35%. Sounds awful, but they're not even going to think about touching you till you're way past that. You see what I mean? But at least I know my state because I get it measured all right? more frequently than the average bear. I mean, I'm almost sickly obsessed with my Fitbit. And as John knows, you know, I'm building new classes at Siena. It's one reason they brought me in. I'm building the class, the first class on the Internet of Things, pretty unique and novel because no one's written a textbook yet. Can't find one. Bookstores ask me to tell them what book the students are supposed to buy. And then uh, beyond that, you know, I'm commissioned. It looks like next spring I'll teach a course on Digital Twin. And I'm bringing this up because I do intend to have my students work on a very basic modeling of humans. And I'm spend a lot of my time trying to figure out how they're going to get data about themselves. The Apple watch that you know, I haven't figured out how to get the actual data from them yet, but we will. Right. And it's a start. At least I'll know my heart rate in, in estimated calories burned. And they're going to do some things with that. We'll see what we can contribute. You no, know, it's, it's coming. The, the blood lab on a chip thing is, you know, it's it's getting real close at 23 blood tests. It does continuously. Well, that tells you a whole different story than having the lab come up sometime every morning between six and midnight <laughs> and and doing the blood test once a day when you're in the hospital. Yeah. You know, but it's coming. Well, I mean, again, I've been fascinated. And that's not even really a a good adjective, but, uh, I, you know, with diabetes, um, I, I just struck by the slowness of the development of devices, right? It's just, re, you know, it's the Super Bowl this year. Oh, I'm trying to remember the name of the company. Uh, Nick Jonas, you know, pop singer, did the current Dexcon, right? Wow, we're, we're finally getting a little bit better at the pin pricking, so you don't have to do it. Uh, and all this stuff should be in the body. And people look at me like I'm crazy and I'm going, we've been putting something far more obtrusive in humans for half a century. Pacemakers. They actually mess with your control system. We're just trying to observe. This should not be that hard. And Jim Rothman agreed, agreed with me entirely. FDA just has published two new drafts that are out for review. You know, one of which is just, dealing with finger stick type devices it's like we understand finger stick okay let's let's not make every new device take six years before we can use them because we wonder about a finger stick yeah hey i'm a big may west fan frederick <laughs> uh, I'm, afraid, I'm pretty sure that was her who said that <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I, you know, I can't undo my past, so I'm making sure I get the most for my money. Yeah, it's just my digital twin hates that quote. <laughs> Amazing. Uh, it's interesting. I mean, I, I don't want to sound like it's interesting because in 2007, I did a biotech startup to try to do real time blood chemistry monitoring, implantable real time chem blood chemistry monitoring. Nobody was interested, nobody thought it was you. I, I'm I'm blown away by that. I'm blown away by that. That yeah, and I faced the same thing as I was trying to. I contemplated leaving and doing a startup, and I had physiologists and other people, and everybody thought it was a great idea. But I'm uh, I'm way too risk averse to just walk away from something else that was going well for me to try and change humanity, but. That's Adam, really would I think it would alter the course of humanity if you could have continuous blood monitoring. We, we the insurance got, companies we have, would hate it. We have five or six people on here who haven't said a word, and and we're kind of at the end of the time. But those of you that have been very quiet listening and hanging in here, I'm I'd be curious to just hear a couple thoughts.
Oh, the silence. Back to before church. <laughs> we were, we're if if you before church, we're all in the back row, and right now we're all in the front row. So <laughs> yeah, well, you know, so this is probably seem like a joke if you could see my image, but I actually have to go get my hair cut. <laughs> it's 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 a quarter inch longer than normal, and I got to go to a wedding tomorrow. Hey, I'm I'm glad I don't have to get mine cut. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just want to thank you for coming and talking with us, and I hope we'll have other times to talk to you. Is, I'm not. Okay? I'm very available. Is it okay? John knows. Follow up with you and and discuss these issues now. Just you have my email. We'll make appointments. Um, like I said, I've had this burning desire to be more in your field. Um. If I could actually make a a, a contribution, I, I'd come over. <laughs> well, you, yeah. you you certainly can, and and you're welcome. We just have no resources and no uh, and nothing except enthusiasm to offer. Um, uh, your comment on diabetes was interesting to me because my my aim was a, a di uh, was a diabetic retinopathy virtual twin before I got derailed by the COVID epidemic. Yeah. Uh, and and so uh, I'd love to talk, but but I'd love to brainstorm the ideas of what that walk through your trajectory and ask those questions. We've been doing it in an informal way, but you have the structure you provide, I think, is uh, in, it's interesting because we've reinvented quite a bit of that structure, but not all of it. And, yeah. and so it would really be helpful to, to, to do that. Well, let me show you like there, I, I think I touched on 10 percent of the material I have. <laughs> it just gets deep real quick and it, it, you know what it really just to take a lot of time to deep dive it but for you know just to let me share and my barber will just have to wait she's she's a lovely woman and i'm married to her and she's waiting in my garage <laughs> hey well if they um but if just the to give you an idea and the steering group um, you know, if you guys wanted to consider offering up the possibility of a small task force or, or some yeah. focused thing on digital twin stuff, um, we know everybody's got way too much to do. But, um, you know, I've, I've talked to Rusty about once a week up until last week where I left him alone so he could finish this. But but if we formally wanted to get started thinking more seriously about Digital Twin, you know, not a subgroup, but, but a task force with the invitation out that it's being formed. And, and if Rusty's willing to chat with people. Sure. Un informally for a few weeks and see if we come up with a plan to actually write something that would be constructive i mean let me offer uh, a counter idea john it sounds like and, and i'm sorry is it do you go by jim or james me oh james. yeah okay james there's too many gyms around including yeah luca in my group so i'm james <laughs> okay james no I, I believe me i uh i don't like uh butchering people's names um i love that you i'll say enthralled by improving the plight of people with diabetes right if we could work on one problem and use kind of my systematic way of building something of use i don't think anything shines the light on this thing more than showing people something that changes outcomes for people if we could define that and then build a team that could do that, that would be powerful. Well, that's how do you create a proposal to do something significant that is not unaffordable, but, but would produce 
that kind of a single dramatic focused event. Yeah, you know, as I said, I should turn as a. I'm gonna do some work. I'm, you know, my uh, semester ends next week. It ends when I submit my final grades for my students, probably on Wednesday. I take a few day break, and then the first week of June, I, I start my pursuit of building my next courses. And it's kind of open ended, and maybe I'm gonna make. Uh, I'm gonna start looking at diabetes. And maybe I'll, I'll bother you, James, more than you're going to come after me. Well, the reason we chose diabetic retinopathy is because with your cell phone, you can take a fundus image. Okay. And, and according to Google, you can do AI-assisted uh, stratification and diagnosis, although how well it works is an open question. Yeah. So it's totally non, non-invasive. And it's not continuous monitoring because you have to take the cell phone picture, but you could do it yourself. And you could do it at home. I guess the key question is, so what What does doing that tell someone? Well, how will that improve their life? Well, let's, let's, let's have that discussion. I mean, because that, that's right. derailing this, this virus. Uh, uh, but, but the answer is uh, treatment for diabetic retinopathy is not so wonderful. The progression rate is extremely variable. The t- intervals that, over which you need to go for uh, to an ophthalmologist for evaluation are uh, currently fixed and could be uh, changed. Okay. So, so like cancer diagnosis, some people need to have your colonoscopy more frequently than others, for example. And so right. If you had a responsive treatment that already could save enormous amounts of time, money, and potentially get early treatment for people who need it. Yeah. So you've articulated that so clearly and simply, you almost ask yourself, so why isn't that the state of the art today? That would be what I said, but, and, and uh, I promised you when I tried to sell it to the VCs. Hey, let's let's talk. Let's talk about it. But I think it's, there could be, but, but, but thinking of an immune model, I think we could articulate cases that would be similar. Yeah. Well, the other thing is, look, there's way more unknowns than known still on COVID, way more. And it's probably the unknown unknowns are probably even way larger than we could comprehend. And between all of us that are still left on the phone, we probably know at least three or four people that have had it and not had the standard kind. I have a very close friend. He's a long hauler now. He was the least suspicious of all my friends. His BMI was beautiful. His health was beautiful. His fitness was beautiful. And he got this thing six weeks ago and can't shake it. What are we going to do for them, right? I, that That's a whole area. Maybe it's more appropriate for this group. Right. Or you could ask a simpler question, which is when do you give a, a, an anti-inflammatory and how much do you give? Because if you immunosuppress, then you don't control the virus. Right. And if you undersuppress, then you have all the septic shock and immune autoimmune damage. And, and we're haunted here in Indiana by Lily Zygris, which was a famous drug failure to treat sepsis, which they couldn't titrate because they couldn't monitor the immune system changes, which happened over very short periods of time. Okay. You gave too much, the patient died of the infection. You gave too little, they died of sepsis and they couldn't titrate it. And so it was withdrawn. Uh, so, so, but you need fast reporting for that potentially. So, so, but th- those would be areas we could potentially brainstorm mm-hmm. tools. 